for the introduction. Okay, cool. And uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to present some of the work that I've been doing uh, as a postdoc at the uh, Natural History Museum here in London, working with Pete Greenrod. And some of the some of the work I will be presenting today is a, also a continuation uh, of the work that I have been doing as a PhD student at University College London, working with uh, Tom Mitchell. So my current research project uh, is about recent and active surface processes uh, or surface changes on the moon. Uh, but for the past two years, uh, I have been mainly focusing in Toro Street Valley, uh, which is the Apollo 17 landing site. And this white uh, spot down there at the bottom of the slide is where the lunar uh, uh, module Challenger uh, landed in 1972. So one of the geological targets of the Apollo 17 mission was this five kilometers long landslide deposit, which is this bright uh, high albedo uh, unit here in the, in the center of the slide, uh, which is also cut by a, a thrust fault. And um, yeah, and so like the Apollo 17 mission, uh, also our project, my project has a focus on the light mantle uh, landslide and the thrust fault. So in particular, we have two tasks. Uh, well, we have three tasks. First one is understanding the origin and dynamics of the light mantle. So this five kilometers long landslide deposit. A second task is uh, understanding uh, the present day activity of the thrust fault, which is called the Lee Lincoln um, scar uh, fault. And then we have a third uh, task, which uh, yeah, hopefully we will be uh, able to uh, expand uh, in these uh, last 10 months that I have left of my postdoc position uh, about global change detection and active processes. Like, uh, yeah, you can see here is a GIF showing a new impact crater uh, on the moon. And so the talk today mirrors uh, the, the structures of, um, of my uh, research project. So we will start by with a really brief, quick introduction about Toros Vitro Valley, uh, the landing site uh, of the Apollo 17 mission. And then we will continue discussing the hypermobility of the light mantle landslide. Then we will be looking at some uh, evidence of recent slope deformation processes of the submassive, which is the mountain from where the uh, light mantle landslide uh, developed. And then finally, just a few slides showing our uh, current or ongoing work on uh, detecting global change, global changes in active, active processes on the moon. All right, so yeah, so Torus Litro Valley was the destination of the Apollo 17 uh, mission in 1972. Toros Vitro Valley is located between Mare Serenitatis and Mare Tranquillitatis, two of the large impact basin on the moon. And here on the left hand side, we have a really, I think, cool view, oblique view of Toros Litro Valley taken. This is a photo taken from the lunar module. And here in the middle, uh, you can see the um, uh, command module. So the, the two modules detach it. This was uh, during the descent. Uh, maneuvering. And uh, so we have a view of uh, Toros Litro, which is ex essentially is a graben. Uh, so it's one of the valleys uh, bounded by Norma Fault uh, that were uh, created in response, uh, in response to the extensional stresses following the formation of the large impact craters early in the geological history of, of the moon. So the uh, Apollo 17 astronauts spent three days on the lunar surface. They used a lunar rover, uh, which allowed them to cover almost 35 kilometers uh, across uh, Toros Litro Valley. So this is the uh, route uh, they made during uh, the three days. So they set so many records uh, of any Apollo mission, the longest distance. And one of the uh, success of the main success that success 
uh, of the mission was the collection, uh, the, the collection of a core sample from the landslide deposit from the top 60 to 70 centimeters uh, of the landslide deposit. And so here I have a video. So this is a original footage uh, taken from the camera that was on the, on the lunar rover. Uh, it was just monitoring, everything was happening, recording all the actions and this is edited. So just to make it a bit shorter, hopefully you can hear the sound. And uh, showing okay, yeah, Jim Cernan hammering okay. the drive tube and then extracting it. Gene Cernan extracting the drive tube. Um, so yeah, so NASA decided to uh, keep this uh, core sample uh, uh, store, sealed, preserved for hey, Bob, almost uh, 50 five, years. It's what I think is a blue gray rock. Probably the it's got a dust so that's a quite long, it's made of two samples, uh, it's a double track, two. And so uh, these samples are now have been studied. Did you see it, Bob? Sorry, it's yeah, full. you can just see the final moment the Roger, of the collection. A thing in your hand there, and uh, we will just have a quick look at the, at the sample. There you go, as some of the lunar material that have been brought back. Uh, by Apollo 17 astronaut. As I said, uh, NASA decided to keep this uh, two sample close for almost 50 years, waiting for the time where uh, more advanced technology would be available to study, uh, in this case, this sample in much uh, higher details. And yeah, so these two samples, these two section of the core are now studied under the NASA ANSA program. Uh, Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis. The, the top half was open in late 2019. The uh, bottom half uh, was open in early 2022. And uh, yeah, and so this star is showing the location of the collection of the, of the core of the landslide right in the middle. But we will see more about this later in the talk as uh, part of our uh, involvement in the uh, ANCSA program. Okay, so uh, the light mantle, we said, is this uh, well, quite, uh, well, deposit with a really long run out, five kilometers long. It's been giving, let's say, headache or great fun <laughs> up to you, uh, to the community, trying to understand the hypermobility and actually the origin of this uh, deposit. So the uh, initial, well, one of the very first hypotheses is that uh, the ejector, from the impact that generated the Tycho, um, the Tycho, sorry, I'm going with a laser pointer again, the, the Tycho crater, this 85 kilometers uh, crater uh, in the uh, southern hemisphere, we can see some of the rays departing from, from the crater. So some of this material travel across the lunar surface for more than 2000 kilometers, bang, hit the back of the submersive and trigger the light mantle. Uh, but a uh, 2017 paper by Schmidt et al. and Schmidt is Harrison Schmidt, the astronaut geologist of the Apollo 17 landslide, published this paper revisiting all the uh, Apollo data plus using uh, new high resolution images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, this uh, NASA mission, uh, the latest NASA mission to the moon, so they are suggesting that the light mantle is actually made of two uh, density units. And first of all, based on just observation of high resolution image, they noticed that uh, there is a section of the light mantle with higher albedo than another one with lower albedo. So the idea is that uh, when you have your regolith material on the, on the lunar surface, the longer it stays at the surface, the darker it gets. Uh, due to space weathering. So based on albedo differences, they start thinking, ha, maybe there are two different deposits, one older and one younger. Then they went on reanalyzing some of the Apollo data, index maturity, uh, agglutinate, and in this moment, I apologize, I don't remember all of them. They went through all uh, reanalyzing this data. And uh, they uh, conclude that there is a older 
light mantle unit, about 200 million years old, and a younger light mantle unit, something in between 1,710 million years old. So if now we have two instant landslide events, then the uh, Tycho impact event is not enough to explain the occurrence of these two separate events. So we e either need a uh, additional triggering mechanism or a completely alternative uh, hypothesis. And so the paper is suggesting that the seismic activity associated with the Lee Lincoln scarp, so the lobate scarps are, are recent, uh, one of the most recent tectonic uh, structures on the lunar surface, which are the surface expression of thrust fault. So the paper suggested the seismic activity associated with the Lincoln scarp has been the uh, triggering mechanism for this multiple uh, long run out uh, landslide. Okay, so we can now start uh, discussing the high mobility of the light mountain landslide. So the work we have been doing in trying to better understand what's going on there. Um, so yeah, so here I just, uh, just showing you some of the uh, mechanisms that have been uh, proposed to explain the height mobility of, uh, of the landslide. So the uh, first idea uh, that came along with the idea that the Tycho uh, impact event trigger the landslide is suggesting that some of the kinetic energy of the ejecta impacting the, uh, the submassive, the mountain, uh, what trans was transferred to the debris, to the mobilized debris, and so contributing to the high velocity and long run out of the light mountain. And then we have some other, um, some other hypotheses. Some of them actually uh, valid for terrestrial long run out landslide. For example, the dry fluidization by dynamic fragmentation, which basically consists in the, the finest part uh, the finest particle of the debris generated by the fragmentation during these high energy events would be able to fluidize the moving uh, mass. The acoustic fluidization, where the fluidization instead comes from the propagation of acoustic waves through the moving debris because of this high energy event. And then regulate and train entrainment. And this paper is actually was focusing on lunar granular flow. So suggesting that um, during the movement of the debris, uh, material, extra material regularly was entrained by the landslide. So increasing the volume. And so increasing the, um, well, uh, yeah, the velocity. So through the volume, uh, enhancing, um, so increasing the energy of the event and enhancing the run out of the light mantle. And then back to the Schmidt et al. 2017 uh, paper, who just came <laughs> with a bunch of new ideas on how to look at this, uh, this area. They are suggesting, although they say we are speculating, uh, gas fluidization by solar wind volatiles. So the idea is that uh, solar wind volatiles implanted uh, in, into the regolith um, would be released during the uh, mobilization of the debris. And so the release, uh, through the release of these uh, gases, volatiles, will then fluidize uh, the light mantle. But all this could be valid. The problem is they are really difficult to uh, prove because of lack of theoretical and experimental support. But also, I would say, I would argue for the scarcity of the field data related to the internal structures of the landslide. So we, the um, direct observation of internal structure are really important in terrestrial, in understanding terrestrial landslide, extremely useful in trying to understand uh, the emplacement mechanism through the interpretation of the internal structures. So it's something that here uh, on the moon was not possible, um, was not possible back then. And so, Equally to uh, the importance of direct observation uh, in terrestrial landslide, another other mechanism important that's been uh, yeah, suggested and proved to be really important in the emplacement of terrestrial uh, large 
uh, landslide are friction weakening mechanism. So these are mechanism, um, so a bunch of chemical and physical, let's say, reaction uh, mechanism triggered by frictional heating. So, you know, when you just uh, move your hands uh, one against each other, you can feel the heat, a bit of heat. So similarly, but to a much lar larger scale, you will have the development of frictional heating right at the base of this large landslide sliding uh, over the surface of failure. And so this, uh, the frictional heating would be able to trigger this weakening mechanism that then will dramatically uh, reduce the uh, friction of this uh, large landslide. And so accelerating the mass uh, yeah, and so uh, generating this really catastrophic uh, large uh, event. So this frictional weakening mechanism has also been proposed uh, in landslide on Mars, Ceres, and Iapetus. The, uh, the key point for the development of this friction weakening mechanism is the localization of the shear surface. So you have the deformation of the sliding mass will just uh, focus in a really narrow deformation zone the uh, narrow surface of rupture. And so this will uh, yeah, activate uh, uh, this weakening mechanism through frictional uh, heating. But let's go back to our light mantle and look at the, uh, at the submassive. We really have no obvious uh, EXCA uh, visible. So this is one of the points that has been um, uh, puzzled. Uh, the community uh, uh, doing research on the light mantle, we have no uh, visible head scar. We don't really see a clear surface of failure. So can we, can we maybe think that uh, uh, processes that uh, we see happening in terrestrial uh, large landslide may be valid uh, in a lunar context uh, for the light mantle uh, case? It's really difficult. So in a way, we cannot do this comparison. But what we can do and what we have decided to do is anyway investigating from, let's say, a theoretical uh, point of view, uh, the viability of uh, this um, uh, dynamic weakening mechanism, so triggered by frictional heating using anorthosite uh, bearing gouges. So anorthosite. Uh, would, uh, is a plagioclase rich type of rock, which would represent the bulk composition of the submassive. So what we wanted to do, we just wanted to simply test the frictional behavior of uh, uh, lunar analog material and try to uh, investigate whether this friction weakening mechanism may have played a role in the, during the initial uh, phases of the light mantle uh, landslide. Okay, so what we did, we requested some uh, anorthosite bearing rock, uh, as I said, as lunar uh, analog material to the ESA sample analog duration facility at Harwell in UK. Uh, we took our rock and we went to Rome at the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology what they have this uh, machinery, which I just uh, simplify with a sketch, uh, Shiva, slow to high uh, rotary shear apparatus. This is uh, commonly used in um, uh, studies of uh, uh, yeah, friction in earthquakes um, or fault mechanics uh, studies, but it also been applied to understand uh, the friction behavior of some material uh, in uh, in relation to a, a large long run up landslide on Earth, the uh, Earth, man yeah, Earth Mountain uh, landslide uh, in Wyoming, a Eocene landslide, uh, terrestrial landslide. So what we did with, um, with our rock uh, sample, we, uh, cre uh, we grind it uh, until we generated a gouge, so powder uh, with a uh, uh, the particle size less than 250 uh, micron. And so here we have a view of the sample chamber. So uh, the um, Shiva has one side. We have a stationary loading system where we can apply pressure on our sample. And on the other side, we have a rotary column 
that can just spin around so we can simulate uh, large displacement up to meters. And uh, I think I have here a just a quick video just to show you. This is a top view of the sample chamber, stationary lo uh, loading system from one side, rotary column from the other side. So what we wanted to uh, do is simulate it with Shiba, is simulating uh, the sliding conditions along an inclined uh, surface similar to the slope of the sample seat. Okay, so here is a really simplified sketch of our uh, simulated sliding condition. So we have uh, our block of material uh, on, on a slope um, um, on under uh, gravi uh, gravity condition like, uh, like on the moon. And the uh, inclination of, of our slope is about 30 degrees, which is not far from the current slope of the submassive. And so this block will be moving, sliding down uh, with an acceleration of 0 0.0 meter per second square, so under uh, lunar gravity. Okay, so extra information about our uh, simulating condition, what we did also, okay, considering our uh, density of average density of an autosite bearing, uh, bearing rock, we ran a series of experiments um, with, uh, with using different loading uh, loading. Uh, yeah, load, sorry, 2 MPA, 5 MPA, uh, uh, megapascal, and 10 mega uh, MPA. So with these different loads will correspond to uh, different thicknesses of a theoretical lunar lens light. And uh, so, yeah, so we also run experiment at room humidity, but also at high vacuum condition. So to simulate the absence of a uh, lunar atmosphere. The final thing uh, we need to know about our experiment. So we let this, uh, the material start sliding with this acceleration, okay? Until we reach a peak velocity of one meter per second. Then we stop accelerating and we just let the, let's say material sliding uh, at, at a constant velocity. Why we did that? Because in all this, um, in this type of friction experiment, and basically all the materials that have been tested uh, in fault mechanics studies, um, at this velocity, materials show a dramatic reduction of friction. So we want to check. We wanted to check whether our lunar analog material would behave in a similar uh, fashion. Okay. So these are the results from our in total six experiments three at room humidity right at the top and uh, other three in a high vacuum. So in, in these plots on the vertical axis, we have the coefficient of friction. And uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the slip, so the displacement, so how far we move our let's say, sample down the slope. So we see uh, from a bit less than two meters up to five, five uh, meters. As we can see from this, uh, um, curves, we don't really see a significant reduction of the coefficient of friction. So we kind of concluded that our lunar analog uh, material, an autosite bearing material, has a high dynamic shear strength. And so how this result compare to other results present in the literature from uh, other type of materials? Okay, here are the red box, uh, are our results. Again, in this plot, vertical axis is uh, the coefficient of friction. This time on the uh, horizontal axis, we have the slip rate, so the velocity, okay? And here, 10 to the power of zero is our peak velocity of one meter per second. As you can see, uh, basically we've done, um, so uh, the localized yeah, dynamic friction weakening does not occur in our uh, uh, material, in the material that we tested, uh, whereas, it does occur uh, for other uh, um, material that have been tested in uh, uh, terrestrial condition. Okay, and so somehow these are the conclusion uh, from our friction experiment. We cannot really, so friction weakening mechanism, uh, mechanism are not supported uh, about, 
are not supported by uh, experimental evidence as we did try in our in this work we tested in this work so probably friction weakening mechanism did not take place during the initial uh, stage phases of the uh, light uh, mantle lens line placement and so this means that uh, other mechanism must have dominated uh, the emplacement of the of the light mantle and so responsible for its uh, long run out. And so in a way, we are back to square one. Probably we never left <laughs> square one. We are back with our initial list of uh, proposed mechanism. And so this work, uh, this, uh, yeah, the investigation of the hypermobility of the light mantle re requires um, still further investigation to understand, uh, yeah, uh, what happened during the emplacement of the light mantle. Okay, still a few, uh, a couple of slides uh, about friction experiments. So apart from uh, the measurement of our coefficient of friction, what we did, we also took some of uh, some, some material after we ran the experiment and we did some uh, microstructural observation. We decided to, to anyway look what happened to our material after the experiment. And uh, one of the, well, yeah, one of the uh, interesting observation we made uh, are these uh, structures here called class cortex aggregates, CCAs, and which are, uh, I here show you uh, with this uh, orange, uh, dashed uh, uh, line. So these are uh, clasped. So we have a nucleus, a central class, which is surrounded by fine grains uh, fragments, which derive by, from the breaking of, uh, of the clasped uh, edges. And here on the right hand side of the, um, I don't have the pointer any, anymore, sorry, laser pointer. On the right hand side of the slide, we have a really nice example of this. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, fine grains fragments surrounding uh, the central nucleus, the clust, and we also have some really beautiful incipient fractures that would have uh, generated even more of this halo, in a way, rind or finer material if the displacement would have uh, gone far. So at the beginning, we mentioned the the core sample extracted from the uh, light mantle lens light. So we decided. Okay, we run our experiment using analog uh, lunar analog material. We have real lunar material extracted from the lens light deposit, lunar lens light deposit. Let's see if we can see any of the uh, microstructures um, or grain fabrics that we observe uh, in our uh, uh, experiment. So before doing that, I also taking a break and I can have a sip of water and for you stop uh, from listening my voice in continuous. <laughs> I show you a, a video of the 3D scanning of the top, uh, uh, top part of the uh, core sample, the Apollo 17 sample extracted from the uh, lens light deposit. It's super cool. I mean, the level of the details is amazing. And here on the uh, right hand side, uh, we clearly see the difference in um, from a 1974 X-ray scan uh, at uh, the bottom. Uh, yeah, at the bottom and at the top, this is a X-ray computed micro, micro, uh, micro tomography scan taken in 2019. So yeah, so NASA waited for, for these to have uh, uh, more advanced technology to study uh, this sample in uh, uh, better uh, detail. So we have been looking at, we started looking at some of this, uh, uh, yeah, um, section, uh, they make up this, uh, the entire core sample. And so these are just really preliminary observation we made, we started, really not long ago, uh, but we think they are in incredibly interesting. Uh, so in the uh, blue box here, uh, there are two of the uh, 
class cortex aggregate we saw two slides uh, ago. So these are the microstructures generating, generated during the friction experiment that we uh, conducted in lunar analog material. In the orange uh, box instead, we have classed from the uh, Apollo 17 uh, uh, core sample in one of the, of the section. And what we see are structure that resemb resemble extremely similar to the CCA, the class cortex aggregate we saw uh, during our, uh, after the friction experiment. So this is really interesting. We really need to uh, look uh, farther into that. This is just a visual resemblance. Say, so, whoa, that's great. But we really need to understand the origin of this uh, class fabric in the core sample, understanding whether uh, this is linked to the lens line placement mechanism or some other type of processes um, yeah, involved. Anyway, so this would be really, really important to, uh, yeah, as critical uh, step towards interpreting the mechanical behavior of the light mountain lens line, understanding whether these uh, class fabrics uh, yeah, were generated by some mechanism during the emplacement of the lens line. Okay, so that was the end of the part about the uh, hypermobility of the, of the light mantle. Sorry, we can uh, jump to, well, our third part of the talk, uh, which is about um, slope, the slope deformation processes of the submassif, which is, uh, yes, the uh, mountain from where, uh, probably I still haven't said, this is a, a bit more than two kilometers high mountain uh, from where the light mantle uh, developed. Um, yes, so we also mentioned at the beginning that we may have two different distant deposits, but what is important here is that we have, uh, well, some people were able to uh, uh, attribute a absolute age to the light mantle uh, unit. And so this is somehow the only extra, first of all, th this is quite cool. This is the only extraterrestrial lens that for which we have a core sample uh, from the deposit. And it's the only extraterrestrial lens light then for which we have a ab associated absolute age from uh, sample analysis. And so what we thought of, uh, yeah, what we thought of doing is using um, uh, the uh, absolute age attributed to the lens light deposit. So to use the light mantle as a geomorphological marker uh, and time constraint for surface changes. So we have a, uh, lens light unit with an absolute age. So by applying the principle of superposition, any everything, any uh, changes, any surface changes that we find stratigraphically above the uh, lens light deposit uh, must be younger than the lens light deposit itself, which means it's uh, younger must have uh, occurred uh, over the past 70 to 110 million years. Uh, and so in a lunar context, this would be really young surface processes. So really interesting to investigate. And um, yes, so uh, probably the best example of this principle of superposition are these really cool small scale extensional structure. So small scale grabbing. Uh, we, we were not the first one to identify these structures, but uh, uh, these guys, Waters et al, 2010 and 2012, um, identify uh, these small scale structures using uh, newly acquired high resolution images uh, from the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, camera. And uh, so the authors also uh, managed to uh, attribute a, an age. So probably these uh, structures are younger than 50 million years. 
So based on uh, the depth of the of the graben and on the um, assumed rate of uh, infilling of um, of the graben. And so we thought, okay, uh, maybe we can apply the same principle of superposition uh, to the slope of the summer sea from where the landslide developed. So saying anything that we uh, find, any changes that we find on the slope must have postdated the removal of the, of the landslide. And, uh, and so again, the, I would say the best, best example of uh, this, uh, well, extre extremely young surface changes postdating the landslide deposit at boulder tracks. Again, we were not the first one to uh, spot uh, the boulder tracks, so boulder falls, but we ex extended uh, the observation to the entire slope, mapping them, and we made other, uh, other type of observation that altogether we think are quite, uh, quite interesting to reconstruct the history of deformation of the of the South Pacific. So here, I just uh, yeah just want to, to highlight a boulder. It might be I don't know uh, eight ten meters in size, maybe a bit more, and you can see this uh, mark marks left on the on the surface. So these are the marks left by the um, rolling and bouncing of the boulders uh, during its fall. What we see, we see other type of uh, boulder tracks, different sides, and um, we also see them like overlapping. Again, principal superposition, we have an idea of uh, a sequence of events happening one after the other, although we are not really able to uh, tell how far apart these events are. On the right hand side of the slide, so this is another view of the slope. And here I kind of sketch the uh, structures that uh, we see in the, in, in the satellite image. So the yellow lines are uh, uh, the boulder tracks. And uh, these things that look like a fried egg is a, uh, as the crater with the ejecta and this wiggling light is uh, lines is what we uh, call regular disturbance, regular creep. So what is the message from this observation is that on top of seeing um, many boulder tracks overlapping one of each other, we also see that the, these boulder tracks um, are uh, modified. Some sections of the tracks have been completely removed and the elements that have been affected the uh, boulder tracks are new impact craters like this one. This is the largest in the area. It's about 120 meters in diameter. But probably the most effective elements that is removing um, section of boulder tracks are uh, 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 the regular uh, uh, disturbance creep. And here I just show you the, the pattern, the, the texture that this creep uh, is uh, leaving on, on the surface of the slope uh, of, the, of the salt massif. So it's kind of granulated, oh, not sure uh, is the right word, but uh, you see kind of the regularly kind of breaking. And this is the, uh, yeah, the break of the, let's say top part of the regularly that then slowly move down slope. And here to the uh, right hand side, we actually see some of this material moving and in filling, uh, filling up uh, uh, pre existing craters. So, something I still haven't mentioned, sorry, is that the, uh, some, some work in the past have estimated the survival time of these boulder tracks. Uh, so, up to 35 million years. So, these are again extremely recent surface changes on the moon. And because we see uh, some of the section have been removed. So it's telling us that uh, some processes have been happening after their emplacement and also recently. And so again, the takeaway message from all this bunch of observation is that we have a sequence of events. So surface changes have been continuously uh, happening on the slope of the summer sea. Okay, so 
we also made some other uh, observation, uh, morphological and structural features, structures that we identified. So in yellow, again, are our boulder tracks. In red, the uh, small graben identified uh, on, the, on the deposit of the submassive, uh, sorry, on the light mantle. And this is the um, Lee Lincoln Lobate scarp. So just to show you quickly what other type of observation we made and attribute to slope deformation processes are starting from the summit of the submassive here in green, we identify structures that resemble crystal graben. So crystal graben are, yeah, kind of depression defined by small scale um, uh, normal fault that usually interest your uh, environment form where when slopes, um, there's a removal of the basal support of slopes that then readjust to the new condition. And so that's what we think, uh, that's how we interpret uh, the, the, uh, the structures here. Then we move to some other type of structures uh, in light blue at the, in the upper part of the slope. These are linear structures parallel to contour lines, okay? And uh, they create a breaking slope. Sorry, I didn't actually mark, mark these uh, structures, but here you see these uh, higher albedo linear structures. Yes, they produce this breaking slope. We actually have really nice uh, view from the ground. These, these are photos taken by astronauts and see these uh, high albedo linear structures. That's the uh, uh, structures uh, we have been mapped on the upper uh, part of the slope. Then moving towards the uh, lower part of the slope, we have still linear uh, features, uh, but this time they are oblique to contour lines. So not parallel anymore, oblique. Here mapped with the blue line. So this is a sketch that is showing uh, what I've seen, what I see in the, in the uh, satellite image. What is also interesting, uh, there is a crater rim here, this one, that it looks like cut and modified by uh, these uh, linear structures. Okay. So we analyze the orientation of uh, these map structures and we analyze, yes, the, their orientation in relation to uh, the topography, so to the contour lines, but also in relation to uh, uh, other um, tectonic structures identified in past work, like extensional uh, features and the Lilian construct, uh, lobe scarf. And so from the analysis of their orientation, so we, uh, let's say, reconstruct what we think it could be a plausible history of deformation of the slope of the, of the sand massif. And so we can start with a uh, cross section. So here uh, it's kind of summarized the main uh, structures of uh, of the subsurface of the uh, of the of Taurus Retro Valley, so we see we have the uh, uh, thrust folds here. Uh, this is the uh, infilling of the material. This is the debris. This is the uh, landslide. So we can start, let's say, trying to link the subsurface structures, the tonic structures, with the surface. Uh, sorry, the structures at the surface and trying to understand how they affect um, uh, each other. Okay, so yes, so just to make sure this is not to scale, but this is a section uh, so we can, uh, yeah, start reconstructing our history of deformation. So our, let's say, um, interpretation starts with the recent tectonism associated with the Lee Lincoln uh, Trust Force. And as some other uh, uh, publication have noticed, uh, uh, they map these small scale extensional structures that they have interpreted be linked with the flexural bending of the back scarp area um, uh, associated with the Lee Lincoln transport. And in our interpretation, a key element uh, represented by uh, the presence of the ancient normal fault bounding Toros Retro Valley. So this red 
uh, inact well, uh, inactive um, normal fault. So usually associated with trust fault, we also have back trust fault uh, in the um, back uh, on the, let's say, hanging wall of uh, trust fault. So in this case, the stress is that would have created a back trust fault, just simply reuse, exploit this existing uh, surface of weakness if we if we want um, of the ancient normal fault, so reactivating it in reverse mode. And so this reactivation creates uh, some structures that are, yeah, I mentioned, uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning. So right at the base, we have some space that has create has been created by what we think is the react the drag associated with the reactivation of the uh, of the normal uh, fault. So we have structures like the Nansen moat, and here we again we have a nice view uh, from the ground. Uh, just uh, since to give a sense of scale, we have some astronaut footprints here in the foreground. In the middle ground, we have the lunar rover. So this Nansen mode is an oval-shaped uh, aperture in a way, 40 to 50 meters deep, right at the base of the submassive. And all along the, the base of the submassive, we also have, we observe a basal trough, this time about 10 to 20 meters deep. So uh, yes, and associated, what we think is uh, associated with this reactive stresses, associated with the reactivation of the, uh, of the normal faults in reverse mode are these linear structures oblique to contour lines. And it was kind of very close to the orientation of the um, small scale uh, grabbing features. Okay, so basically we have due to this reactivation, and the drag as associated with this radiation, we have creation of basal support, uh, sorry, creation of, uh, of uh, space at the base. So removing basal support to the slope, all right? Which now uh, it has to readjust. So this, the, the slope now goes, uh, undergoes gravitational uh, adjustment. And that's what we think the Linear structures right in the upper part of the of the slope, parallel to contour lines, so reflecting this uh, gravitational control in their formation would be uh, uh, associated with. Uh, yes, the breaking slope, and again, as in response to this gravitational uh, adjustment, then we will have the formation of uh, crystal uh, gravity. And finally. We mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning this pervasive uh, presence of regolith creep that efficiently remove a section of uh, young uh, boulder tracks. So we can really see everywhere on the slope. And so we uh, think that has been um, largely, largely due to gravitational adjustment, plus probably shaking, uh, let's say, contribution from the seismic activity associated with the trust fall, but also maybe new impact craters around uh, providing ground shaking. Okay, so uh, yeah, we still have a few minutes, so I will just wrap up quickly. The main takeaway uh, message, I think, from this work is that we have recent tectonism, then, then uh, coupled with long lasting influence of the subsurface geometry, okay, so with this ancient fault reactivated, so has uh, caused continuous slope deformation of the sun massif. So we have an array of evidence of uh, this uh, history of deformation, continuous uh, deformation of the slope of the sun massif. So the next uh, question would be is the Leeling fault active present day? is something we cannot tell. Uh, what we uh, tried to do is doing some uh, image co-registration. Co so we took uh, image from 2009, 2012, and 2018, but we see no changes at all. Nothing has changed. So the thing, uh, what could be the little link scar is not active at all. So it's been recently, but not anymore. Maybe it's active, but nothing has happened in these uh, nine years. 
or it's active, but the deformation is so small, the rate of deformation is so slow that we are not able to uh, see at this uh, resolution. Okay, just to say, we are now on the hunt for present day surface changes, mainly new impact craters. This is a really tiny one uh, that we spotted uh, in between 2009, 2012, not far away from uh, Toros Retro Valley, south to the South Massif. And we also be trying to extend our temporal baseline to detect new impact crater using Apollo uh, imagery. We have quite high resolution imagery, like down to one meter per pixel from the metric camera of the Apollo mission. This is the Apollo 15 landing site. You see this uh, new dark spot. These are the largest one, which are only a few meters. And these are more than 200 changes detected in these 42 years. Are mainly uh, splotches, like stain of the surface. It's not really a new crater, but this is just a uh, given idea of how important is the um, uh, impact cratering uh, processes on, on the moon. It's a continuous process and how it is affecting the lunar surface. So uh, now we are uh, using temporal images and uh, doing image ratio. So to actually uh, highlight the uh, changes that these new impact craters uh, produce on the lunar surface. We can really see a beautiful rays uh, here. So this is an ongoing process and uh, with another beautiful <laughs> new impact craters, uh, I'll leave you with that. And thank you so much for listening. Sorry if it took a bit uh, longer uh, than expected. Thank you so much.